Welcome you. Thank you for coming this morning. Before we start, we're going to have an introduction by the uh, Assessore al Patrimonio of the City of Venice, the owners of this space, and also former Assessore for Tourism of the City of Venice. So Paula Mar is going to welcome us on behalf of the administration. <laughs> Thank you very much. I try to read something in English. It's not my language, but I, I try. Dear participants, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to this program. I'm happy and proud to represent the local administration at this today's smartest innovation camp, entitled Redesign the Relationship Between Tourism and Urban Space a Horizon 2020 project. I look for, forward to hearing city administration and representatives of tourism industry from eight European cities speak about sustainable urban tourism mobility and housing. The result emerging from this, the event will be very interesting and useful to the Venice administration, as the project offers a comparative picture of the current situation. In fact, in fact our administration is tackling the issue from several different angles. Tourist accommodation facilities. In the 2017, the municipal administration has issued a ban on converting buildings in, into tourist accommodation, whether hotel or BNBs, or making extension to those already in existence. Application can only be passed by the uh, council on a case by case basis. Crowd flow management. In an ongoing sophisticated attempt to manage tourist flow, the City Council has approved in the 2019 the new regulation for establishment and regulation of the assets fee to discourage day trippers from coming on the most congested periods. Data acquisition. In an effort to take over tourism, Venice has set up in early 2021 a state-of-the-art control room with the data-driven approach to managing overcrowding at tourist hotspots. We now have aggregated data on how many people congregate in different parts of the city, on which country they are from, how fast they go, where they stop and want what meters of transportation they are using. The Church and Convents of Saints Cosme Damiano on Giudecca Island, where we are now, is a, a site of urban regeneration owned by the city of Venice, who restored in uh, uh, 27 with European funds. The Comune grants the use of the former Church of Science Cosme Damiano, where we are now, to Serendipity, a Venetian benef benefit company and project partner, whose mi main mission since 2018 is to repopulate Venice by raising startups and bringing high quality jobs in the town. The Venice City Administration is most honored to host the smartest innovation camp, and I warmly wish you all the best for this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Paola, and thank you to the city for 
given us this wonderful space that we get to use and for these next two days. So let me remind you of the fact that we have a two-day program. Today is mostly workshop and seminars and presentations to inspire the people who will participate in tomorrow's Ideathon, where we will try together to find some solutions to the issues and challenges that emerge from the project and are going to be presented this morning. So two days, seminars the first day, and tomorrow Ideathon. So day one. This is the schedule for today. I'm speaking first because I'm the founder of Serendipity, the benefit corporation that uh, Paula mentioned. Thank you for pretty much summing up what we do here. Uh, it stands for Serenissima Development and Preservation Through Technology. And again, to repeat what Paula just said, the mission is to contribute to repopulating the city of Venice uh, by fostering the creation of jobs through the uh, innovation and uh, the uh, support of startups that are housed in this, spa in this space. Eventually, that, those jobs will create residence is our mission and our goal. The place that we're in, uh, obviously, we call it H3 Factory. Obviously, it was a church. It's part of the convent of St. Cosmos and Damien. Next door is a cloister where the nuns used to live. And this was their church. It's in maps. I don't know why it's crooked like that. It's in maps since uh, 1528. And for 100 years, though, it was converted after it was abandoned in the early 1800s. It was converted into a factory during the Industrial Revolution. And for 100 years, inside here, they were making garments in the factory called Harian. So actually, when you walked here, these floors would extend all the way into each one of the apses. So you walked and you had a ceiling on your head when you walked in. And for 100 years, you can see some of the arches in the corner of the picture there. And then it was abandoned in the 1980s, so not that long ago. And then the city, as Paula said, restored it in the early 2000s and chopped off the floors, reopened the church. The frescoes were painted white and they were brought back out, and so now we can use it as an incubator and uh, create new businesses for the city of Venice. Quick note about what we do as Serendipity, just for those of you who don't know us. We do three main things. I'll start with the culture component, and I'd like to thank Emanuele Vilch Barberio, who is uh, the director of the cultural side of things here. We have concerts, we, there, were, there was a movie shot inside here. We do all kinds of things, mostly on weekends, so I encourage you, if you're from around Venice, to come and see what we do in this realm. Thanks to Emanuele. Grazie Emanuele, who's also put together all the sound. <laughs> While I'm at it, I'm going to thank Leo, who's also going to video uh, re record the entire proceedings for the next two days and then put together a nice video. All of this is going to be on YouTube as soon as we're done with the filming. The other thing that we do, already mentioned, is startups. Uh, I want to just mention the main program that we do, which is MIT Design Venice. There's a big uh, poster on the back of you which is a collaboration between Serendipity and MIT DesignX, the one from Boston, the original uh, program. We started last year. We have teachers and professors from MIT come and support and instruct our startups that we select every year. So every year we select 10 startups, and then the faculty from MIT come every couple weeks to support their growth and to launch them into the real world. These are the startups we selected last year in the four themes that we have. The reason why I'm saying a lot of this is because tomorrow we consider to be a recruiting event as well for MIT Design X, and we hope that some of the ideas that emerge tomorrow could possibly participate in the program this year. As you can tell, as part of our yearly program, tomorrow is a day where we hope to recruit some people, the submissions, if you're interested, are at the end of the month of July. And then after the submissions come through, we select 10 
and then they go through the program in the fall. And but the third piece that we do is research. I just want to mention briefly the one on the left, which is the program that I started in 1988. I'm a professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, and I've been bringing students from the U.S. to Venice since 1988. So 35 years of bringing students to Venice. You'll see them here. There, there's some students here today. So you see them roaming around. If you're interested, on Monday, they will present the results of their research that are all projects about Venice but I'm not going to tell you too much more about that. Because the main reason for being here today is the other stuff that we do. As Serendipity, we participate in grants, and the most important one that we've been working on for the past three years is Smart Desk. I'm not going to talk about that because uh, Paolo Russo will talk about that. So I'll leave it up to him to give you the details. And before we go and give uh, the, the microphone to Paolo, I just want to thank the entire uh, serendipity staff, which for putting this together, all of you, without you, this wouldn't have happened. So thank you all, serendipity, raise your hands and thank you for putting to, together a great. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Paolo Russo, who is the principal investigator of the Smart Desk Project. And uh, he's been guiding us for three years through thick and thin, as they say in the U.S., through the COVID uh, emergency and everything else. So, Paolo. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for being here. It's nice to see this uh, strange mix uh, of uh, research partners uh, and students uh, and also a lot of friends from Venice and Venetian activists, uh, people I haven't been seen for a long time also, some of you. So it's, uh, it's really exciting uh, and uh, it's not casual that when we started to plan for this project, uh, we thought that Venice would be an ideal place uh, to come back to at the end of our project as one of the case studies uh, in our project, but also as a perfect place to talk about the topics of our projects and the results that we, that we get. Uh, this is an international, uh, uh, Europe-funded uh, um, Horizon 2020 classical, I would say, research project. Uh, the European Commission funds many different uh, research activities. This is research. But as usual, uh, they ask you to produce a research uh, that uh, is likely to make uh, a real social, political impact. So to produce uh, results uh, that inform uh, different publics, that transfer knowledge uh, to those uh, that can make use of this knowledge uh, to create uh, better, in this case, living conditions, uh, for local communities. Uh, this is uh, a project that has been funded under a call uh, on social exclusion and urban transitions. Uh, so we tackled uh, this topic uh, uh, coming in uh, from the point of view of uh, tourism-driven transformations uh, in uh, urban areas, which is uh, my own uh, and most of our partners' uh, main area of uh, uh, scientific uh, engagement. So we did uh, uh, put up, I think, a quite strong and ambitious research proposal to study the so-called ills of tourism for urban community, something that some of us have been working on for 25, 30 years. My doctoral thesis in, 19, in 2002 was already about the kind of stuff that we have been working on. Smartest. Uh, we didn't use the word over tourism then, but uh, people like in the academia, like like Professor Paolo Costa, that's looming <laughs> in this area, uh, has been doing this kind of research. And uh, what happened uh, in the last few years, uh, uh, I would say a period, uh, an exceptional period uh, after the big uh, financial crisis uh, in. Uh, 2008 or 2012, uh, and the next big crisis, the COVID crisis, is that uh, uh, 
over tourism, the excess of tourism and the problems uh, it was causing uh, starts becoming uh, an issue not just for the few usual places like Venice, but for a much wider and much longer number of places in the world to the point where it seems to have become a general trend and we need probably new instruments to de decipher all that. Uh, so yeah, we know there's a lot of tourists. Uh, these tourists have certain uh, positive and negative impacts. Uh, negative impacts uh, sometimes are even superior than the positive ones for local communities. Uh, uh, and what do you make of that? And the big question is, uh, and so what for local community? So what for cities? So what for cities of the future? Uh, can we imagine a world uh, in which the most uh, visited tourist populations uh, become areas just for temporary mobilities? And my friend here, Giacomo Salerno, has been working on this concept of the short-term city. Can we imagine cities that are only for tourists? Because that is the trend. That is the trend that not just in Venice, uh, but in many of the historical city centers uh, and even whole cities uh, around Europe and in the rest of the world. We are only dealing with European money, so we study what happens in Europe at its borders. Uh, Israel is one of the, uh, of the partner countries in our project, uh, thanks to Tel Aviv and uh, Jerusalem universities who are, who are partners. Uh, but this is actually happening everywhere. It's happening in the global south, uh, we don't have cases of the Global South here, but it would be nice in the future to talk about that. We uh, dressed up intellectually. We create a very big like uh, uh, conceptual framework uh, to uh, be even innovative in our research proposal. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go deeper into that, uh, but we are following the lead of uh, sociologists like John Urey who has uh, uh, invented uh, this uh, idea of the mobility paradigm. We study society and we study places uh, through the action, the agency, and the power of uh, things in movement, people in movement, uh, capital in movement, uh, which is a temporary plugging into places, uh, but with a very strong power of transformation over that place. Uh, this is the approach we brought in and we understand tourism in this way, as something that uh, is a flow made of people, made of vehicles, made of capital, made of ideas and of culture that sets its foot in one place, transforms it, and uh, eventually sometimes disrupts it or creates a new reality. But then uh, we have to understand what is the role of the people who live in those places uh, as a subjects, uh, objects, uh, victims, uh, or protagonists uh, or of those uh, transformations. And uh, so our project uh, wants to produce an ample base uh, of evidence, uh, data, algorithms, analytics, uh, and also discourses uh, that could feed uh, the uh, urban agenda of the future, an urban agenda that is fully cognizant uh, of the challenges produced uh, by tourist mobilities, transnational mobilities uh, over place, uh, which has not been the case until very recently. Until very recently, for instance, at the level of European Commission, uh, tourism is treated mainly in sectorial terms of when we do research in tourism for the Commission. Uh, we do it uh, to promote uh, tourism, to find ways to better market tourism. Uh, we are not looking at the edges of what is happening into place. This is more properly research uh, on cities, on urban studies, uh, and the role that tourism and uh, international mobility has in all of, in all of that. So we, our ambition at the beginning of the project, and the, there is always a very big gap between initial ambitions and outcomes at the end, but uh, would be to provide instruments uh, to create uh, uh, more resilient uh, cities. Uh, and when we talk about resilient cities, we especially think to resilient local communities. These uh, invisible or visible actor that uh, doesn't pick up as it should uh, in statistics. Let me make an example mainstream ways uh, of measuring uh, the economic effects of tourism. 
We have uh, tourism growth on one side. Uh, we have uh, population or income growth on the other, and we create a simple correlation. And we can say, OK, tourism has produced uh, an increase uh, of the living condition of local communities. Uh, what is the mistake, the fallacy in this idea is the local community is not the same. Uh, from moment zero to moment one, uh, yes, at moment one, the local community might be wealthier, but they are not the same people that you had at moment zero. So what happened with them? Well, mostly they have gone. They have gone because they can't afford uh, or they can't cope uh, to live in a place which has become over-touristed. And Venice is a very good example of that, but Barcelona, which is our own ground of research uh, is as well. And uh, we did, uh, and this is like more anecdotal, but uh, you imagine the kind of shit we had to go through in our project. Uh, we started the project uh, in uh, January 2020. Do you remember that month? Uh, and we had this uh, very nice, very big uh, scientific proposal uh, which uh, was going to see on the ground uh, the effects of over-tourism, measure the impacts on local communities, observe the local communities coping uh, with over-tourism uh, or gentrification of transnational uh, redesign uh, of uh, livelihoods. And then after two months, uh, the apocalypse arrives and uh, it basically totally changes the object of our project. So we have been like, for two years, we tried to, to change the way in which uh, we should uh, apply the methodology of our project. Uh, we, we could do that to, to some extent. But for us, COVID uh, has been uh, an unexpected laboratory of uh, studying, analyzing uh, the questions of dependence and vulnerability of tourist places, requiring fresh approaches uh, to how we study tourism. And uh, the objective of research in uh, tourism in view of resilience. Some of you will remember our initial framework of research. I'm not going to go through that, but the whole idea is to study social exclusion as something that happens in between uh, tourism as a driver uh, of uh, urban transformations uh, and uh, what the policy does uh, can do. But not only policy, even governance structures and the citizens' uh, initiatives uh, can do to cope uh, with those transformations. And the result is places uh, which are more or less uh, inclusionary. So our research approach uh, went through basically three stages of research. Uh, the first, uh, the simpler one, the one that doesn't need to be on the ground, that it only looks at statistical data, uh, has been looking at uh, European trends uh, transversely. Uh, what was happening in uh, European urban areas in terms of the kind of flows uh, they have been attracting uh, and uh, 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 social trends observed uh, in those same areas. And we came up uh, as, uh, let's say, the main result of that first part of the project uh, with a clusterization, a classification of European regions uh, in terms uh, of uh, how attractive they are and for which time type of mobilities and over which period of time, whether it's a really fast growth or a more steady and continued growth uh, in time. And so we went to measure social indicators uh, in these four types of regions uh, to look for clues uh, that there could be some kind of association uh, between uh, being uh, a highly attractive uh, region uh, for tourists uh, also subject uh, to intense uh, tourist pressure or uh, highly attractive regions uh, for other types of migrations uh, and uh, the, uh, the social trends happen in there. And we, we found some evidence uh, that over touristic uh, regions in Europe, those that are colored in red in this map, uh, are those that uh, are able to benefit more, of course, in economic terms from tourism, but also those who are more subject uh, to social gaps, to social injustice, uh, to social spatial uh, um, uh, inequalities uh, picking up in those places. And so that gave us the opportunity then to go down at case study level. So we initially had eight case studies, uh, among uh, uh, which uh, some are also represented by our partners here. Uh, 
uh, to reconstruct uh, the context and the drivers uh, of social inclusion or exclusion around uh, tourism and transnational mobilities, uh, uh, urban regimes, uh, moments of change, uh, the role that infrastructure development had in all of that, uh, the social landscape of cities uh, before and after tourismification. We have been analyzing what we call the wicked problems, uh, so dissecting the causal relations uh, between drivers and results uh, with the data that we have been able to raise uh, in our project. Uh, we have been focusing on the consequences, uh, the embodied, the lived consequences of these trends uh, for local communities, uh, especially those most vulnerable collectives uh, in each of these cases for different reasons. So every case study has tackled one problem or so two problems. Uh, they have worked with specific vulnerable communities. Uh, and uh, the last part of the project about which uh, Erika is going to talk after me from Polytechnic of Turin uh, has been uh, a last phase of uh, participatory engagement uh, of local stakeholders uh, in this case study cities uh, to come up uh, with solutions or forms of mitigations uh, that are actually co-designed, uh, verified, uh, tested uh, with the data available. Um, so what are <coughs> the main lines of work in our project? Uh, I will be very brief about uh, that. Uh, two main uh, transversal uh, lines of research. The first about a residential instability, the exodus, which is not just a problem of Venice is anymore. I recently saw a paper by our colleague Filippo Celata looking at 15 big European destinations in Europe and how they are all suffering from the population of their historical centers and even beyond that. So mainly, this is like the elephant in the room, mainly under the pull of uh, the rise of what we call platform hospitality, houses, houses uh, there is a new housing crisis, which is partly explained by, by that. Uh, rising rents, uh, professionalization of the housing, uh, the promotion of real estate value chain, uh, expulsion of uh, residents. Uh, and uh, there are other phenomena that uh, also work in favor of the displacement of local population, which per se is a form of social exclusion because we are removing uh, people from their natural habitats, we are uh, seizuring uh, social ties, uh, we are making social capital weaker and more rarefied. Uh, we are marginalizing uh, those uh, who cannot displaced and they are stuck in one place uh, because they need proximity to jobs uh, so they accept worse housing con conditions uh, in order to resist in the tourist place. Uh, so we did a lot of like transversal research uh, to have data to say okay this is happening at European level and then when we go to down to case studies level we have better data that can explain who, why and what and what are the areas uh, which are more at risk of residential displacement. And then uh, we had another line uh, together with the colleagues from the University of Alicante here and some of our colleagues uh, uh, about the smart, the smart tourist city. The idea that the smart city a reality in urban planning uh, is something that ideally would have to benefit local populations. Uh, but when the smart city happens in a tourist place, it becomes all more mixed and more ambiguous. So sometimes the smart city is for the mobile populations. It's not for the vulnerable, stuck citizens of our city. So our colleagues have taken a very broad uh, approach to study stakeholder networks. So who is actually constructing the smart city? How, uh, uh, how Consistent is the ecosystem of smart tourism planning uh, with other ecosystems, the tourism industry ecosystem, uh, the planning ecosystems uh, that are like uh, producing uh, uh, tourist places. And we have some results which are actually controversial in this uh, sense. And then Giuseppe Vars will be one of our speakers at the roundtable session, so we could go deeper into that. And then every case study has given some other demonstration, uh, research outputs uh, about a wide range of topic, uh, from the disenchantment of local communities and the rise of anti-tourism discourses uh, in Amsterdam, uh, to what we studied in Barcelona, the relation between uh, precarious labor 
and precarious uh, uh, housing, which we suspect is uh, another of these transversal themes. So basically, main thing, uh, tourism workers uh, are not able to live anymore in the same cities where they work. They are the most vulnerable, the most likely to be expelled because they get the, bad, the worst salaries and the worst, uh, the, the worst uh, uh, kind of uh, contract that allow upwards uh, social mobility. Edinburgh, mega events uh, sustaining uh, and reproducing uh, precarity. Jerusalem, disconnected cultural communities from the mainstream tourist circuit uh, that are, seem like a lost opportunity in terms of creating a pacified uh, and harmonious uh, tourism development. And so what are the opportunities there? Uh, in Lisbon, uh, uh, a very close approach to commercial gentrification, so transnational dwelling as an agent that disrupts uh, life uh, in a community through the transformation of its commercial landscape. Ljubljana, the lock-in of mainstream tourism products and promotion, again, as a lost opportunity for the inclusion of entrepreneurs uh, which are more peripheral in, in strict sense because they operate uh, outside of the city center or because they offer different kinds of products than what is normally offered in the tourist marketplace. Turin, uh, in Turin, we didn't talk about the tourists at all. We talked about students, the international student mobilities. Uh, as an agent of transformation, which is uh, also subject of uh, reification and marginalization, but has a nightlife, and the nightlife is conflictive. And uh, finally, of course, uh, Venice. Uh, and uh, Venice has taken this approach to study the co-determination of labor hyper-specialization, so the hyper-specialization of the historical center of Venice in providing uh, this kind of jobs. Uh, low added value, you can call, uh, jobs, uh, and how this is related with unaffordable housing, uh, awkward uh, mobility, and uh, commuting uh, in and out of the city in the two senses, which is unprivileged, is, uh, is, uh, is problematic. Uh, and how it all is feeding depopulation trends, and always we look at the other side of the coin. So, how can we change this condition in order in this chicken and egg relation to embark a, a new trajectory of social inclusion? And I will finish with uh, a few legacy goals. So we had a lot of research outputs uh, in our project. You can, there is a QR code there. You can access all our publications which are in open uh, source. Uh, and this is something that we give back to the scientific community, and for two years we have been presenting at seminars, congresses. Uh, all our data are in open, even some algorithms of analysis that we've used uh, are in open access, so everybody can replicate uh, what we have done in other places with new data. Uh, we have the city labs, uh, and uh, Erika will expand uh, on that. Uh, but an exercise in citizen participation, uh, which has been very limited in time, but we hope it will stick, it will become something more structured uh, in the future. And finally, the future opportunities, will we inspire innovators? So this is the real bet of these two days today. Uh, uh, when we talk about innovation, we don't just think about classical technological innovation, also that, uh, but we also think about social innovation, business innovation, policy innovation, new ways of doing policy. So how are the solutions uh, discussed uh, in our project? Uh, how can they get to the market? How can they get to the policy tables? Uh, and we invite everybody, and we do that uh, like as a main dimension of our project, to use our outputs, our storylines, our data, our results, our tests, uh, to dig uh, for research and development funding in the future. So why not a smartest uh, 2.0 in the future without me, because I'm done <laughs> with that, uh, but uh, which is really working on uh, practical solutions on uh, implementation of some of the things that we have been saying until, until now. So this is, uh, this is basically it from my side. Uh, I will, before Sandro, I think uh, Erika is coming on stage uh, to tell you a little bit more about Good morning. Um, I'm 
here I represent the team of Turin, uh, which was the team that coordinated the work package four, uh, which was about the implementation of the city labs. Um, city labs were in the objective uh, of Smartest Projects project has um, um, participatory fora, uh, which uh, uh, has the objective to engage uh, the, the, the community, the business, uh, uh, and the, the institutional stakeholders of each uh, case study city uh, to identificate uh, um, innovative forms and tools uh, to tackle the, the forms of exclusion and Im imagine some uh, um, solution in terms of uh, more inclusive uh, destination ecosystems. So this, the seven cities which implemented the City Lab uh, were Amsterdam, Barcelona, Jerusalem, Lisbon, Ljubljana, Turin, and Venice. Um, and the starting point of the City Labs, as uh, Paolo mentioned before, uh, were um, an analysis of the, of the local context, um, which came up with the differences among one to, to the other. Uh, we have cities which are uh, in, in a typical over-tourism uh, cycle, while others, as Turin or Ljubljana, are just uh, potential growing uh, tourist cities. Um, we have specific dimension of mobility, as Paolo mentions. We have students' uh, uh, mobility. We have uh, tourism mo mobility, but we also have other kind of uh, groups uh, involved in, in our uh, um, in, the, in the case study. And we have uh, different effects uh, induced by the tourism phenomena. Um, as Paolo mentioned, I, I will just uh, scroll down to, to show you the different cases. In Amsterdam, we have a disclusion of uh, local residents, but also an issue related with participa participation fatigue uh, in, in, uh, in this process of uh, involvement, uh, involvement of uh, um, the residents in, uh, in thinking about solution uh, for, for the tourism phenomena. Uh, in Barcelona, we have uh, the, the issue uh, of the labor precarity related to tourism um, workers, but also the issue of the housing, uh, um, uh, the housing market. Um, in Jerusalem, uh, we have uh, an unbalanced distribution of the wealth produced by tourism and uh, an exclusion of some uh, groups of the local residents. In Lisbon, uh, we, we identified uh, um, the exclusion of local residents, again, um, from the, the use of the spaces, but also from the commercial activities we changed to respond to the demand of the new population arriving in the city. Uh, and then we have Ljubljana, where the margin marginalization were more re was more related to uh, some stakeholders in the tourism sector. In Turin, uh, where the use of the spaces uh, were changed because of the attraction of the student population, and Venice, uh, where, as was mentioned before, uh, the exclusion of local residents uh, was an issue in the labor, uh, in the mobility, and in the housing sector. So we, we set up this, these city labs in, in each case study city. And the City Lab uh, uh, basically shared uh, a methodology. Um, this means that each City Lab, uh, um, in a context specific way, um, follow the same stages uh, um, during, during the work. But this produced, of course, uh, also different impacts in, in, every, in every city. They were, however, all oriented towards the action. Uh, they experiment uh, with new forms uh, of urban policies or, or, or in also the, the proposition of, uh, of possible policies for the future and explicitly uh, involve the, um, the local administrations. So the objectives, Paul, uh, we, we already saw them, so, um, but in Amsterdam uh, was uh, to uh, think about a um, smart, responsible tourism ecosystem in Barcelona, uh, to work toward the data uh, about the neighborhood change um, in Jerusalem, to create safe and attractive spaces, um, also in places where um, in some particular spaces of the city. In Lisbon, uh, to work toward a collaborative space for observing the phenomenon of, uh, of changing uh, the, the, the urban spaces. In Ljubljana, to work with the stakeholders of the tourism uh, 
and in Turin, a uh, collective rethinking of the nighttime, while in Venice, uh, a collective analysis of the various dynamic uh, impacting the city. So we have very different policy fields, uh, and, and this uh, was um, the reason why uh, also methods and the techniques applied uh, changed from one context to, to the other. Um, we, but in general, uh, old city lab applied this participatory uh, approach in which uh, a wide range range of stakeholders were were involved. Uh, stakeholders were heterogeneous, and this is also probably uh, something uh, that gives value of the work we have done because uh, different stakeholders uh, sit together at the same table. Um, we had. Uh, uh, experts, scholars, and members of research institutes, but we also have uh, a representative of the local administration and the local institution. Uh, we had residents, students, representative of grassroots association, NGO. Uh, we had also entrepreneurs, professional and corporate association, uh, and data technicians and producers. So as you can see, uh, they, there's a really wide range of stakeholders who give us the opportunity to work towards solutions that were complex and made of different dimensions. So we have um, different levels of outcomes. We have some specific outcomes uh, that are more related with the context in which city lab worked. So uh, they, they, these were two uh, strategies and uh, policy indication in each case uh, study. Uh, for example, uh, Amsterdam um, advanced the co-designing practices and new method of engagement. Uh, Barcelona produced a toolkit um, supporting an early warning system to detect tourism-driven social exclusionary process in neighborhood. Jerusalem designed um, a strategic plan for a network of inviting spaces for the city Lisbon prototyped and tested ideas uh, which included structural changes and intersectional uh, collaboration. Ljubljana uh, worked towards uh, areas of tourism and stakeholders improvement and also added the missing creativity pillar to the Ljubljana uh, ecosystem uh, of the tourism. Um, Turin, in, Turin worked toward the introduction of co-design approaches in the city policy making we, which were lacking of this kind of approaches and uh, uh, also indicate strategic uh, and policy indication. While Venice set uh, um, a set of suggested policies to be implemented using the tools of govern government action. But we also have, as Paolo said, uh, and here I conclude, uh, some transversal uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, first of all, we propose a, a, um, an approach and different kind of processes which, ca which can be um, also scaling up or reproduce in other cities. Um, they were all um, rela uh, related to the co-design approach um, and uh, were also the occasion to co-learning and co-creation of knowledge, which also remains in the local community which participate in the City Lab. Um, and just to mention the other uh, outcomes, uh, the co-design of planning frameworks and innovating action, uh, the build of consensus uh, uh, we, um, in many cases, um, we reach uh, uh, on the policy initiative uh, we, we propose, um, and also, uh, well, you, you saw the slide, <laughs> new, the, the new data analytics and uh, the use of data that some city labs propose uh, in terms of uh, implement uh, uh, these use for, for the wealth of the, of the community. Uh, and so the, the hope uh, and the try we are all now uh, doing is to scale up these practices um, for, of course, a more inclusive and resilient urban areas. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm Alessandro Costa. I'm the director of this new kid on the block, this new entity that was established not much ago, formally in March 2022, and uh, effectively we started our operations at the beginning of this year, um, which has very, very, very uh, high ambition, which is to stimulate the participation of a very widespread 
what a broad range of urban stakeholders in the uh, creation and then implementation of what we call a, a new integrated model for sustainable territorial development for Venice and its metropolitan whereabouts, its metropolitan area. Um, but let, let me, I was pretty much intrigued by what I heard this morning. Uh, and let me just turn the, the few things that I want to tell you upside down. Okay, so let me start from, from the very end. What are the takeaway that, that I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to think and, and hopefully pass on my network uh, that I received this morning? So, there are a few things that, that, are, that, that, that started to, to, to connect some dots in, in the things that prospectively we're, we're doing. But the, the first message that I received from Paolo is that smart is not necessarily sustainable. So smart city is not a sustainable city. And what we are trying to do with the nine working areas where the foundation is challenging itself and is challenging the territorial system, uh, we exactly have posed scientifically in the middle sustainable tourism. As more or less the, let's say, the, the source, the, well, just, 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 just to rephrase the same expression, the elephant in the room, or the uh, origin of most of the, 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 the contradictions and dynamics that we need to readdress if we want to live in a sustainable place. Uh, so sustainable and smart, they need to find a way to go along together. Uh, the second aspect is that co-design is the second, let's say, buzzword. So co-designing, you need to involve, it's a complex system. It's a, it's, it's a matter of complex dynamics. If you want to tackle it, probably the most appropriate way is exactly this, is to involve the largest number of stakeholders, largest number of players in defining the, the let's say the, the policies and then the implementation. The third aspect, and I see Andrea there in, second, in the second row. The third aspect are the tools. And tools are what science, research, research and innovation are putting at the disposal of this, this quite ambitious quest uh, for livability and coexistence of different uses of the same space and big data. Possibly, on, on, my, on my personal opinion, what really makes the difference today with respect to what it was a few years ago is that we are now able to launch my presentation. No, we are able to um, acquire a very large number of data large number of information that we can then process in, in new ways. And we possibly can come out with what is needed from one side to inform and to define policies, and from the other side to implement those policies and control the effects of those policies. Uh, okay, enough talk. Let me, let me now just get back to who we are and what we do. Um, yeah, I already told you what is the, 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 um, the main aspect, okay, the main frame and the, and the, and, and the aim of the foundation. Uh, I didn't tell you that yet, that unfortunately we, we have the power to promote projects, to facilitate ideas, to 
accelerate projects, to facilitate the discussion among different stakeholders. Uh, in this very moment, we still don't have, let's say, the financial capacity of uh, um, covering the costs for, 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 for implementing projects ourselves. But we can mobilize, and this is the network that we can mobilize, so it's composed by 40 different players. Uh, some of them are public institutions, administrations, public administration, regional administration, local administration, um, the universities, let's say the academic system that insists in Venice, composed by two universities, the Academy of Fine Arts and the, the Conservatorium. Um, we have quite a good deal of large Italian companies or the Italian branch of international corporations. We involve also the infrastructural space, so the port, the airport, but also uh, railways, uh, uh, electricity, the gas network, so on and so forth, and the financial, the financial um, system. Uh, I'm just telling you a little bit in advance that, that, that in a few weeks, uh, possibly one for sure, possibly two large Italian uh, banks are going, to, are going to, to, join, to join this network. And with respect to what I say a few moments ago, each one of these players has its own network. So if they are on board of this project of uh, definition of initiatives and activities and selection of activities presented by all of them and they can mobilize their own networks, in that sense we really have a place where uh, co-design can be, can be uh, put in place. Just to get back to, to, the, to that slide, to be a little bit more analytic, the nine areas that we're focusing, if you just look at them, if you know a little bit of what, what Venetian dynamics are about, they uh, compose for the response that we would like to give or that we would like to push on very evident and clear threats to the development of this part of, of the world. But at the same time, there are opportunities for the development of this place. When it comes to innovation, we define innovation as, and we, let's say, foster innovation and the, the deployment of innovation in this territory as a way of diversifying the economy. Uh, and obviously the kind of innovation that we are, as most of the things we've taken into consideration, they need to take into account what is, Paolo, very old word, the caring capacity of the system, the possibilities for the system to uh, have the, 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 the or to, to host certain types of activities and to neglect the presence of those activities that are not environmentally or socially sustainable for, for, this, for this area. Um, we haven't really, as, as we are entering in the, the second semester of our real first year of activities, we haven't really tackled yet sustainability with respect to tourism, but we are establishing a crossover project which uh, is focused on defining a target scenario for the sustainability of Venice, which means let's have in that partnership all together, let's brainstorm and try to identify what will be the shape of a sustainable Venice? What will be the, uh, 
how it would be composed. Obviously, it's not something that you can get into a full detail. What do you imagine? What are the communalities that you imagine in a sustainable Venice 10, 15, 20 years from today? So at least you have a direction. You have a northern star that you would, you would try to, 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 to uh, walk through, walk to. And in that sense, we would like to couple this exercise uh, of, 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 let's say, sketching a scenario with a tool to measure in what way and how much the different initiatives that the foundation will, uh, will foster would compose in reaching that scenario. And this is what we are, uh, we've just started working at with the idea of creating a new sustainable index with some peculiarities, with some special features that are, that are connected to the features of, 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 this, of this very place and this very territory. Um, now, very last, very last slides. Tourism, a misspelled over tourism, and sustainable tourism. So this is the path. We have that. We are somehow in the second stage. How do we reach the third stage? And, uh, and I just conclude the, this few words by recalling how I began that. Interconnection, co-design. Um, learning from what you are developing through SmartDest uh, and uh, hopefully the SmartDest 2.0 that won't see Paolo Russo involved in that. Uh, but yes, the, the main reason why I'm here is to, to learn from smart desk and learn from the, the, the experience of those other cities uh, that I know just for being myself a, a tourist in those cities. And which is now, it, it, it's also pretty much interesting to understand what me being a tourist there is me contributing to uh, those challenges in those different places. And using the tools that we have at the disposal for interpretation and uh, hopefully collecting together uh, this data lake that we could, that we could play with. And uh, as for the foundation, we will be very, very happy to keep uh, following up with this discussion with you guys, with Fabio, with Paolo, and with the Entire, entire group of research of the projects and thanks again for having given me this possibility.